Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Collins LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. Today's speaker is Len Apcar, who holds the Wendell Gray Switzer Jr. Endowed Chair in Media Studies, Media Literacy at LSU. I'll let him explain what all that means. Um, Len and I have a lot in common. We're both about the same age. We're both relatively new to Baton Rouge, and we're both baseball fans who are against the designated hitter. But most importantly, our journalism careers are both rooted in the 20th century, an era defined by what are now called legacy media companies. The great media companies of the last century used their power and profitability to unite the country. The great media companies of this century use their power and profitability to divide the country. The great media companies of the last century took responsibility for every word that appeared under their flag. The great media companies of this century have no idea what information they're spreading. The great media companies of the last century relied on the sophistication and smarts of actual people to make decisions. The great media companies of this century rely on algorithms that even they can't understand or master. Fake news is in the news these days, chiefly because liberals believe that it played a role in tilting the 2016 election. But the issue is older and broader than that, and Len is here to explain why. Such a serious introduction. <laughs> but fake, I, you know, Peter and I do have a lot in common. We had a lot of mutual friends. So he was really, by serendipity, the first person I met when I came to Baton Rouge about three years ago. Um, and we play golf together in addition to having interest in baseball. Although I have to tell you, I'm a San Francisco native. I'm a San Francisco Giants fan. He is an L.A. Dodger fan. Uh, so we don't have, we have a lot in common, but not uh, too much. Um, a, a couple of things. Uh, Wendell Gray Switzer Jr., that is Dee Dee Riley's uh, deceased brother who was killed in a Navy training accident off the coast of Virginia. That is my chair. It is named for him. The Rileys gave it as a gift uh, several years ago because they wanted something at LSU that examined media literacy. What is media literacy? It's a pretty broad definition, and one of the, nice, one of the things that attracted me to it is that I, uh, uh, you could really paint with your, a broad canvas. It is essentially ha assessing ways in which uh, we, look at a, we look at sources of information and what I call issue literacy, which I'll get to in a second. Um, how we understand certain issues. In this state, for instance, how do we understand the state budget, which is front and center as one of the major public policy issues this year. Um, while I'm on that, by the way, we do have a, uh, a partnership with The Advocate. Golf does lead to something. Uh, and Peter and I cooked up this website that's on The Advocate. It's a game. I, there's cards on your table. Uh, it's called solvethebudget.com, solvethebudget.org. Go to it, please. It's yes, no questions. You can do it in a few minutes. And you can see, if you, as you're clicking yes and no, uh, the fiscal cliff is narrowing, widening, narrowing, widening as you choose. And if you can close the budget, then bingo, you've solved the budget. Uh -huh. And you can see how other people have solved it, too. Uh, about 4,000 people so far this year have done it. Uh, almost 6,000 did it last year. Uh, so we've had a lot of fun with this. We think it's a great way to educate Louisianans on the, on the issues, taxes, spending, and whatnot, uh, and it only takes a couple of minutes. That's a media literacy example. But you brought me here today to talk about fake news, and I want to get to your questions, so I'm going to kind of uh, rock and roll right through this. Uh, so that I'll give you a little bit of grounding on fake news and what I've been teaching about fake news and how we've been examining it. 
Uh, first, thank you again for welcoming me to this uh, uh, forum in the city. It's clearly one of the most important. We, if you can believe it, we agreed on this about six months ago, uh, but it's certainly very timely given uh, the Facebook grilling yesterday on Capitol Hill and, and again today. Uh, the news accounts uh, yesterday and today provide a fair summary of what Mark Zuckerberg had to say. I'm not going to go over that. Most of the focus was rightly on the horrendous uh, data trading agreement that Facebook made with an outside party and how Facebook cavalierly put at risk the privacy of tens of millions of Americans. Uh, my focus today is on the manipulation of our media uh, or fake news. Not the fake news that Donald Trump refers to when he simply doesn't like a story or denies it, but fake news manufactured by people with a motive to mislead, uh, to profit, to mock, or merely to sow confusion and perhaps even panic. I'm teaching a class on fake news now, and I tell my students that I am not interested in the collusion question. Uh, let the investigators work on that. Did the Trump campaign work with Russian internet troll factories? And they do exist, by the way. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, to embarrass, humiliate, and ultimately defeat Hillary Clinton? Who knows? Uh, did Russians alter our presidential vote? Unlikely and probably unknowable. Um, but I am interested in how false information moves through social media and how, what we can do about it, or how we can become more savvy news consumers. How can we train our minds to look more critically at what we see? Because we must do our own work and trust our own judgments. I'm the son of an engineer. I respect technology. I grew up on the edges of Silicon Valley. Uh, no algorithm is going to do all of our thinking for us. S Zuckerberg is not going to solve all the problems. It's simply our job. At the outset, I want to stress that my hair is not on fire about fake news. Fake news is a tiny, tiny portion. Peter and I argue about this between the ninth and tenth holes. It's a tiny portion. He agrees with this, actually. Uh, it's a tiny portion of all the news that is flowing through our, our information flows. Uh, and studies have shown an ever-growing numbers of people who say they've seen fake news. But the number of individual stories is relatively small. So is this still really a problem? The answer is yes, it is. The bigger risk is that our social media platforms, Facebook, Google, and Twitter, are vulnerable to infiltration by agents who may wish to widen divisions in a polarized country, confuse parts of the country with utterly bogus reports, and deepen divides. And I'm not talking just about the United States. This really started as an information war in the Ukraine. If those stakes aren't high enough, I want to add one more and why I take this pretty seriously. There is no question, long before Google and whatnot, there has been an insidious war on, in our society that has p the potential to chip away at fundamental values of Western democracy. If we ever get to the point that we don't know what to believe, or whom to believe, then we might decide not to participate or vote at all. That's a very, very dangerous decision. For when there is a vacuum, trouble is not far behind. I am often asked if there has been fake news accounts in Louisiana. So let's take a look at one. The internet troll factory that, that is pretty well known now uh, is the internet research agency on your left in St. Petersburg, Russia. That is a building filled with uh, mostly uh, a social media um, experts, if you will, who uh, try to manipulate uh, accounts all around the world. It's the Internet Research Agency. It's funded by one of Putin's uh, uh, fairly wealthy friends. And it really got its start several years ago in a, a campaign involving the Ukraine. Now, it came to Louisiana, on your right, in St. Mary Parish in 2014. In 2014, on 9-11, there was a, take it, let's go to the next slide. There, this is all fake, and this is all right here in Louisiana. 
It's a fake CNN homepage. That's a fake uh, smoke cloud over the Columbian Chemicals factory uh, in Centerville, Louisiana. Uh, and these are fake accounts orchestrated by the Russians to, we're not quite sure why. Even the Homeland Security official in St. Mary Parish told me, he said, we never got to the bottom of why they picked St. Mary Parish and why they picked Centerville and why they picked this particular factory, which is owned by an Indian conglomerate, which is neither here nor there. It was just one of my faculty members, colleagues at LSU, who uh, is from St. Petersburg and has studied that troll factory, says, uh, he says it was probably just a probe it was just a way to kind of test Louisianans, to kind of draw them out into social media, get you to pass this around. Uh, Duval Arthur, the uh, security official in the, in the Paris, said to me, he said, you know, he called the factory, he called the plant, said, Was there, do you have a problem today? He said, no, we don't have any problem. But they were getting calls from media and calls from uh, EMS. All of this could have turned the county, you know, upside down, but they were able to kind of Put it to put it. You can tell I'm not from Louisiana. <laughs> uh, you, uh, uh, they put this pretty much to rest within, uh, I would say, probably four or five hours. But that's a fake news story. Almost certainly, investigators believe that the Internet Research Agency played a role in this. I mentioned the probe idea. Let's go to the Mueller indictment. If you haven't read it yet, this is pretty interesting reading. This is the front cover page of, the, of Robert Mueller's indictment that was issued in February. This is against the Internet News Agency, Internet Research Agency. I tell my students that, well, we got to the bottom of this before Robert Mueller did um, because I was teaching this example in Louisiana. And sure enough, he mentions, he doesn't mention this story in Centerville, but he mentions that, and I don't quite get this, some Russian agents who are named in the indictment as defendants uh, took a 22-day road trip through, I think, nine states, uh, Louisiana being one, to kind of soak up the culture. I'm not quite sure what this was all about, but that's my sense. Again, unproven, we don't know, but my sense is that there was something going on in Centerville, Centerville Louisiana, and people came through in 2014 before 9-11. Uh, before one of the trademark, um, one of the trademark uh, practices for fake news is to build all sorts of different sites of before 9-11 that are also fake. There was something called Louisiana News on Facebook. It was a completely fake site. They do that, try to draw Louisianans and others who are interested in Louisiana News into a network, uh, a kind of a cluster, if you will, of people who are interested in Louisiana, which is what they did. <coughs> These are two major fake news stories during the presidential campaign. You probably heard of at least one of them, that the Pope had endorsed Trump. It's complete, uh, completely fake. Uh, but it was spread widely. We'll I'll show you some numbers in a second. Uh, this is uh, Trey Gowdy. Uh, congressman from South Carolina who was very big in the Benghazi attack and, and trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, these are two big fake news sites, BVA News and the other one there. Um, and this gives you an, just a, an early indication of the problem. Uh, here are fake, in the red, those bars are stories that were faked and how widely uh, uh, read they were in terms of impressions. People uh, passing them on, on in retweets, passing them on in Facebook, uh, sharing them in, what, in some way. The Pope shocks the world and endorses Trump. It was uh, believable to some, or some people thought it was so uh, hilarious that they just passed it on. But as you can see, there's a very rough cut that was done right after the election. More than a million, almost a million people passed that on. Uh, Hillary and ISIS. Hillary, is, there was a fake news story that said she sold weapons to ISIS. Uh, that's about 800, almost 800,000. Um, you can see the rest. The blue lines at the bottom show you that fake news, this is again a very early study, fake news between August and the presidential vote 
in 2016, um, uh, fake news was shared more widely than mainstream news. News at the Advocate, news at the New York Times, news on Associated Press or whatever. So there's 8.7 versus 7.3. Um, one clue, before we get to the Pope, one clue, the Pope is even in on this, by the way. This is legit Pope news. Uh, the Pope put out an announcement uh, in January, and it's actually quite interesting what he has to say about fake news and the threat it, it poses to uh, uh, our way of uh, just basic thinking as well as Western democracy. Uh, there is an annual co uh, communication uh, letter that he puts out. He mentioned it and went into some detail about this. His, his detail was pretty sophisticated. Um, and he, he has, of course, biblical metaphors. And uh, he, he likened fake news to the book of Genesis where this talking serpent, he says, that's the first fake news story. Uh, I can tell this is a faithfully Catholic audience. Uh, uh, I'll go to the next one. So why do people write fake news? Um, they're fun to see if it'll take off, and I'll tell you a story about that. They want to make mo money. There was a fake news farm in, um, uh, in Macedonia. Um, before the election where there was about a dozen, 20 young people writing stories about the election that were completely fake and they were, getting, they were going viral to a degree and they were making money off it. They closed it down after the election because it got a little too hot for them and they made the money they wanted to make. They want to sow confusion. I think that's what was probably a test in St. Mary Parish. Uh, they want to test political views, want to see how popular things are. I'll tell you a story about uh, Cameron Harris. Cameron Harris is a young guy, graduated from David. There he is. Graduated from Davidson. Uh, he was on the front page of the New York Times, from headline to photograph of fake news masterpiece. This was genius. There's Cameron sitting at his uh, little. P he has a political consulting shop uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, and. He the month before the 2016 election, he was watching polling data. And if you remember, that was the moment when Trump said the election was rigged, that Hillary was going to steal the election, that there wasn't going to be an honest vote. He was refusing to accept the result, whatever the outcome would be. Uh, Cameron was a clever fellow, and he was looking at polling data during all this. And he said he'd never seen public sentiment move so rapidly so far with the notion that their election was rigged and that Mrs. Clinton could steal the election. He said he'd never seen a TV campaign do anything like that. So he thought, I want to test this. He sat down at his kitchen table and he wrote a story that was completely fake. It took place in Columbus, Ohio, at a warehouse in which there were boxes of ballots pre-marked for Hillary Clinton, Battleground State, Ohio, pre-marked for Hillary Clinton, found by a warehouseman, an electrician, I think it actually was, in this warehouse. He had bought a URL for five bucks about a week before, Christian Newspaper Times or something like that. He put that story up on Christian Newspaper Times and it went wild. Now there's all sorts of sociology as to why we believe that that could possibly be true. This is partly what I teach. Uh, people believed there was this sentiment, right, that the election was rigged. Here were marked ballots in a battleground state, pre-marked for Hillary Clinton, and it went viral by, by more than six million impressions in less than 20 hours, 20 hours. That story made him over $20,000 of Google ads. He paid off a little bit of his car loan, some student loans, and the next thing you know, uh, he was on the front page of the New York Times. That's where I first found him. But he wasn't hard to find, and I got him to come down to LSU last spring. We had, some of you may have been there, we had a fake news evening at the Manship School, packed the house, uh, and Cameron said, look, I did this, I know it was wrong, I did this to see if this works. And if I can do it from my kitchen table in Washington, D.C., uh, anybody can do this. And we are, you know, what, for, he's, we need to have, I came down to LSU not just to say I did it and I was on the front page of the New York Times for doing it, but to say we need a conversation about this because this, we are dangerously vulnerable 
to this kind of fakery. This comes from Ben Bradley, the longtime editor of the Washington Post. Uh, beware of stories you want to be true for whatever reason. We tend to believe things, confirmation bias is what soci sociologists call it. It just confirms our bias and we tend to buy it. And it goes on and on. And when we get in groups of people who are, think like us, we even buy it even more. Let's go to the next slide. So what else do we know? We've been warned, we've been warned, we've been warned. Most of you probably know that in January of 2017, after the election, the national intelligence agencies of the United States went to Congress and they also issued a report and they said we are 95% confident that uh, our information flows were breached, uh, infiltrated, probably by the Russians. <clears throat> Now we've had testimony since then, uh, late last year, early this year, again and again, um, that election systems have been hacked. Russian hackers breached at least one in 2016. Uh, we are dangerously vulnerable in voting systems and in our social media platforms. And that they have already found some evidence of Russian media uh, Russians, uh, Russian, that little agency in St. Petersburg and elsewhere, you know, poking around in places that have to do with our elections. Uh, Donna Brazil, a great Louisianan, just finished a book. It's out, came out last fall. You may not want to read the partisan part of it. It's not that partisan. She's very, she's very critical of the Hillary campaign. But she spends a lot of time on how the Russians got into the Democratic National Committee's um, uh, uh, information systems and she said this th this is real it happened here like everybody else the Democratic Committee had a patchwork of, of technology and the next thing you know uh, they, they could literally see the hackers moving through their systems and, and it cost them they're still not done they have a you know kind of a 24-hour monitoring system to keep to keep information within the corral So what, do we, what does this all amount to? On your table, what kind of skills can I give you? How, do you, how, do you, how, can, you, how can you help this? I try to tell my students, I want to give you a life skill. If you get nothing else from my classes, don't, here's how not to get, don't get faked out. Look carefully for attribution. On your table, I want you to take them with you, fold them up. Look for attribution. Who said this? On every story, it's got to be instinctive. Peter Kovacs runs a great newspaper. Peter Kovacs is a very good editor, but there are not a lot enough of him. He's a gatekeeper in communications theory parlance. Uh, he decides what gets on the front page. He decides the agenda of what gets covered. He frames issues. Newspaper editors did this for generations. They decided whether the information was, a, was of appropriate quality to be in your information flow and in, in your paper or in, on your wire systems. That's still part of the system, but there's a lot more going on. And that's why you need this. So in addition to understanding who said it, how do they know? Is it verifiable? What records do they cite or what data? Are they independent? There's a lot of bias out there. There's a lot of motivation. Here's examples of just traditional bias and uh, in some cases fake news. This is a really easy one and people get tripped up on this. Check the URL on the website. The one on the left is fake. The one on the right is real. This is right from a piece of fake news. That's ABC News trying to be faked out. The one on the left says abcnews.com.co. CO is the country, country code for, anybody know? Columbia. The one on the right, abcnews.go.com, that's real. Check the quotes. If the quote seems fantastic or hard to believe, 
just copy and paste it, put it in your browser, and see if it shows up anywhere else. Chances are, if it's only on one place, it's probably fake. You can do the same thing with a photo. Google Images has a way in which you can just copy and paste the photo into Google Images and see if that photo has been doctored. There was a photo during the campaign of a big building. It looked like the Prudential Building in Boston. It says, Hillary for prison, or Hillary for jail. It was lit up, Hillary for jail. Google image that, put it through, it was fake, obviously. So take your card with you, uh, use it, try it. The, Facebook is not going to solve our problems. Twitter is not going to solve our problems. Peter Kovacs can't solve your problem. He can help. But this is, this, this is what the basic blocking and tackling life skill we need now. If we're going to enjoy this huge flow of information. Um, I want to close with, uh, to get to your questions, um, by just saying, I actually think this is surmountable. I'm an optimist by nature. Why else would I come to Louisiana to teach this, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's going to take some work. And uh, it's going to take these kinds of instincts, frankly, when you're looking at a story. It's what academics call critical thinking, but in journalism, all our lives, we've called it common sense. So thank you very much. I want to give one shout out to my student producer, the pride of West Feliciana, Zoe Williamson. And now I'm happy to take questions. I don't need a mic. <laughs> um, technology created the problem, and there may be technological solutions coming down the pike, including the blockchain distributed ledger, which may be arcane to talk about at this point. But what technological solutions do you see coming down that can bolster and uh, legitimize a lot of this issue? It's interesting, you know, when I mentioned Facebook, uh, when I mentioned Lu the fake Louisiana news uh, Facebook page that was part of two th the 2014 attack in St. Mary Parish. Um, just in the last few weeks since I've been teaching this, it's been taken down. And I think it's because Facebook, Zuckerberg referred to this yesterday, Facebook has had a deliberate, systematic campaign to identify fake sites and by the thousands. He gave a number and strip it out of their platform. That's part of it. Um, you know, I, I, I just think, like a lot of things, the technology, the, the, the government, the, the, the trolls, a troll, by the way, is a real life human being. A bot is an automated, an automated Twitter or social media feed, I should define that. Uh, the St. Petersburg outfit is really good at what are called um, uh, tweet storms automated by bots of which St. Mary Parish was victimized by that as well. Um, but it's very hard to say. I, I don't, you know, I don't pretend to know the technology. I think generally there are some algorithmic, uh, uh, there's some algorithmic tweaks that can help. But I don't think that, I think ultimately we're going to have to, we're going to have to have these very skills. That's why I teach them. Because I think it's, it's just going to have to be second nature now. Because we have to be our own editors. There. I guess propaganda or agendas and so forth become so successful in taking over so much of the media outlets, you know, the you know, our source of information that's very liberal bias. How are they so successful in doing that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just staying here with the microphone. <laughs> What's the question? Well, the, the, the question was, the question was, how is it that most of our mainstream media yeah. is li has a liberal bias? Yeah. Fox I think, News? hmm? Fox News? Well, Fox News doesn't. He's a, but you're not referring to Fox News, I assume. You, you want to know why the New York Times is so liberal? Yeah. Most, most, or the Washington Post? I, 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 I'll, Peter may have a, a, a different view than me. I, I'll be, I, I generally think that, that, that it stems from the fact that journalism by its nature 
attracted a progressive mindset. It attracted an anti-business mindset. It attracted a um, uh, it, att it attracted people who were somewhat sentimental about the nature of government and the nature of public policy, um, and believe that um, uh, government and social programs were there to make our lives better. I mean, that's part of the late 20th century point of view, right? New Deal and all that. Um, uh, and I, but I think that's a little piece of it. And generally, I, the newsrooms that I worked in, even the Wall Street Journal, for all its conservative editorial page, I worked at the Wall Street Journal for 12 years, I worked at the New York Times for 24. Uh, there was very much, uh, first of all, there was very much a down, down the middle, objective, a fiercely objective uh, uh, value that we knew that we couldn't play around with the reputation that had been built for generations before we got there, number one. And number two, um, uh, but there was generally a view that this was a progressive, a progr we, were, we were in a progressive country in a progressive time and that it it, the journalism attracted a slightly liberal bias. And I don't think it was just print, by the way. I think it goes all the way back to Walter Cronkite. Is, um, uh, you said you know, no algorithm can replace a human mind. Are you seeing any type of service that you could buy where you, your, your, your news feed from multiple sources is scrubbed through that can screen out fake news? There are some um, extensions you can put on your browser. In fact, before we go, to, we'll take a few more questions. I'll show you a very short two minute, three minute video in which it talks about uh, browsers, uh, extensions you can put on a Chrome browser that can filter some of this out. That's a temporary fix. There are everything from the center. Anybody off to the side over there? Right. Over there. When I read a story, say the New York Times is printed and it's based all on anonymous sources, why should I have any faith in that, that article? Because I could have edited it. <laughs> um, it's a problem. I don't mean to be. I don't mean to be glib about it. It's a problem, and the Times fights this all the time, and we did it to ourselves. What I mean by that is, I worked in Washington for a total of eight years, two different, two different tours, and um, we let the government talk to us anonymously. We let the administration talk to us anonymously. And it was a big mistake. Big mistake. And, um, you know, they now know they can get away with anonymity. I think one of the biggest mistakes of, of online, our online life is that it's too anonymous. It's too, it began as anonymous. And when I was editor of the New York Times website, um, we validated every person who posted on the site, even if their name was Opera Girl. We knew who Opera Girl was. Um, and that chased a lot of people away. It was costly, laborious, all those things. But we, we thought, well, if we're, you know, nobody's going to play and build community unless it's anonymous for reasons that I've always you know, cursed AOL about. But as a consequence, uh, we, have, we have this uh, anonymity built into the system that, that has created this. On this side, anybody on the oh, right side of it? Yes. Um, there are a number of sites you can check validity. Do you recommend any of those, like Snopes or PolitiFact? They're almost all good. Snopes is good. PolitiFact is good. Um, we had uh, another one, I Trust Media was down at the school the night of Cameron Harris. Um, PolitiFact is, is excellent. They're all quite, they're all very good. In the middle. Can you give an example of an ad that the Russians ran during the election? Um, no. I didn't look at ads, I looked at information, but there was a lot of them, and Facebook is now kind of weeding, weeding them all out. That's gonna be easy to fix, because ads are purchased. And I don't know why they didn't have a fix for that a while ago, but they should have. Now, I know you have a hard stop at one, so I want to play this video. Uh, it summarizes a lot of what I've just said, but it's fun.
This is from the Washington Post, that progressive liberal bastion. Facebook, Google, and Twitter have announced new efforts to stop the spread of fake news. Twitter has amped up its mute and report function to slow dissemination of fake news. But you shouldn't leave it up to these big websites to perfectly curate all your news to you all the time. Here are a few easy ways to spot fake news. One, double check the URL. Some fake sites look like they have legit URLs, but take a closer look. This site tries to fool readers into thinking it's ABC News, but the web address is a few letters off. It was abcnews.com.co instead of abcnews.go.com, the real one. .co is the country code for Colombia. Two, does the photo you're looking at seem photoshopped or unrealistic? It could be. Drag and drop the photo you're looking at into Google Images, and it can help you verify the original source of the image. Three, can you identify the original source of the information in the story? Check that source against other sources. If other reputable news outlets haven't picked up the story, it's likely you're looking at fake news. Here are some sites we've seen deliver fake news. Four, think about installing a Chrome extension to help you detect fake news. The plugin called FIB, Stop Living a Lie, was recently developed by four Princeton University students and can help you determine the validity of some news links. The plugin purports to verify pictures, text, tweets, and embedded links. It also checks the site for malware and dead links. Other Chrome extensions like BS Detector and Fake News Alert say they do similar things. Before you send an article to all your friends on social media, consider visiting ideas one through four. You'll thank us later. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC. Specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.